The Iliad, Book 17 When Menelaus saw Patroclus go down, he shouldered his way through the heroes in front and stood over the body. The way a lowing heifer stands over the first calf she has given birth to. Red-haired Menelaus above Patroclus, with his spear out and shield over him, determined to kill anyone who approached. Panthous's son, Euphorbus, was still interested in the fallen Patroclus. He came up, planted himself close to Menelaus, and said, Back off, son of Atreus. Leave the corpse and forget the blood-soaked spoils. No Trojan or Trojan ally hit Patroclus before I did in the heat of battle. So let me have the glory that is mine, if you value your sweet life. This was too much for Menelaus, who said, It's not good to boast beyond your strength, you Forbis. Leopards and lions and razorback boars, the wildest of beasts, may be nothing compared to Panthous's sons, but mighty Hyperon did not live to enjoy his youth when he made light of me as the weakest warrior in all of Greece. He's not going home under his own power to gladden his wife and devoted parents. I'll unstring you too, if you stand against me. Take my advice and get back to your troops before you get hurt. Fools learn the hard way. Euphorbus was not convinced. He answered, Now, Menelaus, you're going to pay the price for killing my brother, and boasting about it, and for widowing his young bride, and causing our parents unspeakable pain. But I could relieve their suffering for a while by bringing back your head and armor, and placing them in Panthous's and Frontus's hands. But it won't take long to settle this. Either put up a fight, or clear out of here. His ash spear hit the desk of Menelaus's shield, but the point bent and didn't break through the heavy bronze. Menelaus charged with a prayer to Zeus, and as Euphorbus stepped back, put his spear through the base of his neck, leaning into the thrust with a strong grip on the shaft. The point passed right through his soft neck, and he fell heavily with a clatter of armor. His hair, braided like twisted myrtle with gold and silver, was drenched with blood. A man has been rearing an olive sapling in a lonely place, where it has enough water. It is beautiful and growing well, quivering in the breeze, its white buds blossoming. One day a storm comes with violent winds, tears it from its trench, and leaves it on the ground. So too, Panthous's son, Euphorbus. Menelaus moved in to strip off the armor. A mountain lion, supremely confident, has seized the finest heifer in the grazing herd. First, he crunches her neck in his strong jaws, then greedily laps her blood and soft innards. The herdsmen and their hounds shout at him from a safe distance, but, pale with fear, they lack the will to take him on. Not a single Trojan opposed Menelaus, and he would have carried off Euphorbus's armor easily, had not Apollo begrudged it. Taking the form of Mentes, a Sasonian commander, he went to work on Hector, and his words flew fast. Hector, you're chasing something you'll never catch, the horses of Peleus, a team hard to handle for any mortal except Achilles, a goddess's son. Meanwhile, Atreus's son Menelaus has gotten in position over Patroclus and killed the best man we've got, Euphorbus, Panthous' son stopped him cold. And the god went back into the toil of men. A dark shadow of grief passed over Hector. He scanned the lines and saw one figure bending over another, stripping off armor, the other beneath him in a pool of blood. He strode forward through the men in front, his armor blazing, and the cry from his lips was like Hephaestus's inextinguishable flame, Atreus' son heard it, and said to himself, Ah, me! If I leave behind the fine armor and Patroclus too, who fought for my honor, all of the Greeks will hold it against me. But if I fight Hector and the Trojans alone, out of a sense of shame, I'll be surrounded, one against many. Hector is leading the whole Trojan army in this direction. But why am I talking to myself this way? There's nothing but trouble in bucking heaven and fighting a man with a god on his side. No Greek looking on will hold it against me if I pull back from Hector, who has divine help. 
but if I could just find Ajax, the two of us could go back in and think about fighting, even against Heaven's will, make the best of a bad situation, and see if we can save Patroclus's corpse for the son of Peleus. While he thought it over, the Trojans closed in behind Hector. Menelaus pulled back, leaving the corpse and constantly turning around. Like a bearded lion that men with dogs drive from a pen with spears and shouts, his heart is like ice, and he leaves reluctantly. Red-haired Menelaus left Patroclus, but when he reached his own lines, he looked around for Telamonian Ajax and spotted him on the army's left flank, cheering on his men and urging them to fight, for Phoebus Apollo had panicked them. Menelaus ran over and said to him, Ajax, old friend, Patroclus is dead. We'll have to hurry if we're going to get his body back to Achilles. That is the naked corpse. Hector has the armor. Ajax was moved when he heard this. He strode to the front, Menelaus at his side. Hector had stripped the armor from Patroclus's body and was pulling at the corpse. He meant to sever the head and feed the trunk to the dogs of Troy. When Ajax stood before him like a city wall, Hector gave ground and vaulted into his chariot, handling the exquisite gear to some Trojans to take back to town, where he could glory in it. Ajax covered Menoetius' son with his shield. A lioness stands over her cubs. She had been leading the little ones through the forest when hunters came across her, and now, savoring her strength, she narrows her eyes to cold yellow slits. Ajax stood over the fallen hero, and Menelaus came up beside him, nursing his grief. Then Glaucus, the Lycian commander, stared at Hector and said angrily, You're all good looks, Hector, and no fight. Just another big name attached to a quitter. Well, you'd better think now how to save your city with homegrown Trojans and nobody else. No Lycians, at least, are going to fight the Greeks to rescue Troy, since there's no gratitude for non-stop combat with the enemy forces. Are you likely to save an ordinary soldier in the press of battle when you left Sarpedon, your comrade and guest, as pickings for the Greeks? After all he'd done for you and your city, while he was still alive, and you didn't have the heart to keep the dogs off his head. That's why now, if any of the Lycians will listen me, we're heading home. When Troy will be done for, we will be home. If only the Trojans showed the sort of courage real men have when they fight for their country against foreign invaders, laying it all on the line, we would drag Patroclus to Troy in no time. And if we did, if we got that man's corpse out of battle and into Priam's great city, the Greeks would give back Sarpedon's armor, and we could bring his body into Ilion. That's how great a man the dead Patroclus served. The best of the Achaeans, and his soldiers too. But you didn't have the guts to stand up to Ajax and look him in the eye just now, much less fight him, the reason being that he's stronger than you. Hector, helmet shimmering, responded. Glaucus, this insolence is not like you at all. I've always thought you were the most intelligent of all the Lycians, but I have no use for nonsense like this. What a thing to say, that I wouldn't take on big hulking Ajax. I don't rattle Glaucus or freeze up in combat. Sure, Zeus can overpower the greatest hero, make him panic, and rob him of victory, just as he can make men get up and fight. So come along if you want to see how I do all day long, whether I'm the coward you say I am, or stop a Greek or two cold for all their fury from fighting in defense of Patroclus's corpse. Then Hector made his voice carry. Trojan, Lycian, and Dardanian soldiers, be men, my friends, and remember your strength while I put on Achilles' resplendent armor that I took off Patroclus when I cut him down. And his helmet flashed gold as he turned and ran out of the battle. He soon caught his comrades. They were not far and he was running hard as they carried Achilles' gear back to Troy. There, on the edge of war's horrors, he changed armor. He gave his own to be carried back to the city by his fighting men, 
and he put on the inhuman gear of Peleus' son Achilles that the gods of heaven had given to his father, and he to his son, when he had grown old in them, as his son would not. Zeus saw him from his high seat in the clouds, as he buckled on Achilles' armor, shaking his head, the god said to himself, Unhappy man, you have no thought of death, yet death is close. You are putting on the immortal armor of a man who makes you and many others tremble. You killed his comrade, gentle and strong, and you violated the order of things when you took the armor from his shoulders and head. Yet I will grant you strength in recompense for this, and Dramaka will never welcome you home wearing the glorious armor of Achilles. And the son of Cronus nodded, his brows darkening the air. He made the armor fit Hector like his own skin, and Ares, in all his dread power, entered into him, packing every muscle in his body with strength. Hector returned to the field with a great shout, and went among his allied forces, a gleaming image in Achilles' armor. He encouraged them all, singling them out, speaking to Mestheles and Glaucus and Medon, Thersilochus and Asteropaeus and Dysonor, Hippothous, Phorsus, and Chromius, and to Enomus, who read the flight of birds, giving them heart with these soaring words. Hear me, my valiant allies and neighbors! I did not invite you to come here from your cities because I was looking for or needed a crowd, but because I thought you would fight with willing hearts to save the Trojan women and children from these warmongering Greeks. This is why I have been feeding you at your expense and giving you gifts to keep up your morale. So face the enemy and fight! Maybe you'll pull through, and maybe you won't. That's the charm of battle. Whoever gets Patroclus, mere corpse that he is, back to our lines, and makes Ajax give in, gets half the spoils. I'll split them with him right down the middle, and he'll have glory like mine. This inspired them to charge the Greeks en masse, spears held high, thinking they would surely pull the corpse from under Telamonian Ajax. The fools. Ajax killed many over that corpse, but finally turned to Menelaus and said, Menelaus, old friend, I don't have much hope of us two getting out of this battle alive. It's not... I'm not only afraid that Patroclus' body is soon going to glut Trojan dogs and birds, but that you and I are going to get it in the neck. There's a cloud of war covering everything, Hector. Hector, with one thing clear, our sudden death. Call in our heroes, maybe someone's within earshot. And Menelaus, who had a good battle cry, split the air with a shout to the Greeks. Argive leaders! Everyone who drinks at Agamemnon's table commands a troop and has honor and glory from Zeus. I can't make out every single captain in this battle's firestorm, but get out here on your own, out of shame that Patroclus is becoming a ragbone for Trojan dogs. The Ajax that was Oileus' swift son heard him clearly and was the first man out. Sprinting behind him were Idomeneus and his comrade Meriones, a real killer. As for the rest, who could remember all of the Greeks who swarmed into battle, bunched behind Hector, the Trojans struck. A great wave sometimes rolls into the mouth of a swollen river, pushing against its current. The headlands resound as the sea roars to get in. The Trojans came on, but the Greeks stood firm. Around Menoetius' son, their hearts united, their bronze shields locked, and from above Zeus poured over their dark gold helmets a profound mist, for Menoetius' son had been far 
from hateful when in life he was Achilles' companion. Now he loathed the thought of his enemies' dogs playing with his body, and so he roused his comrades to fight for him. At first, the Trojans drove the wild-eyed Greeks back from the body, and although for all their efforts and high spirits they failed to land a spear on anyone, they started to pull the corpse away. The Greeks, however, were back soon, rallied by Ajax, who looked and acted more like a hero than any living Greek, except peerless Achilles. Ajax split the Trojan front lines, as a wild boar in the mountains tosses dogs and men when he turns on them in a clearing. This was the son of Telamon, glorious Ajax, scattering the Trojan platoons that stood around Patroclus and wanted nothing else more than the glory of dragging him back to their city. Hippothous, a Pelasian, had tied his war belt around the corpse's ankles and was hauling it inch by inch through the fierce fighting, much to the satisfaction of Hector and the Trojans. None of them could have stopped what happened next. Ajax's spear coming from nowhere and smashing through his plumed helmet. Hippothous's brains, clotted with blood, spurted out from the wound along the spear's socket. He dropped Patroclus's foot and then fell himself, face down on the corpse, far from Larissa and his father Lethus, his debt to his parents unpaid, his life cut short by great Ajax's spear. Hector countered, but Ajax kept his eye on the bright flare his spear made and managed, although just barely to dodge the bronze point. Hector's spear went on to kill Scydius, son of Iphitus, and the best of the Phocians, who ruled over many from his home in Panopeus. The bronze point passed through his collarbone and went straight through to the base of his shoulder. He fell with a heavy clanging of armor. Ajax then f hit Phorcys, Phanops' son, right in the belly as he straddled Hippothous. The spear point broke the corselet plate, and his guts oozed through the bronze. After he had fallen his hand, still clawed at the dust. The Trojan champions, including Hector, had enough. They backed off, and howling Greeks dragged off the dead, Phorcys and Hippothous, and got busy stripping off their armor. It would have been another defeat for the Trojans, driven by the Greeks with Ares on their side, back to Ilion, and an Argive victory, power and glory beyond Zeus's allotment, had not Apollo himself aroused Aeneas, assuming the form of a herald, Periphas, son of Iphitos, a courteous man who had grown old in Anchises' service. Apollo, a son of Zeus, spoke in his guise. Aeneas, admittedly you will never defend steep Ilion in defiance of a god, although indeed I have seen other men trust their prowess and strength, their courage, and their superior numbers and defend their people against all odds. But in our case, Zeus wants victory for us, not for the Greeks, and yet you hang back in fear. Aeneas knew it was the god Apollo when he looked him in the face. He called to Hector. Hector, Trojan leaders and allied commanders, Shame on us all if we are beaten back to Ilion by the Achaeans without defending ourselves. One of the gods has just whispered in my ear that Zeus on high is on our side in this fight. Let's go straight at the Danans. Don't let them take dead Patroclus to their ships at their leisure. With that, he bounded to the front of the fight and took his stand. The Trojans rallied and faced the Greeks. 
Then Aeneas thrust, getting his spear into Leocritus, Arisbas's son, and worthy comrade of Lysomedes. When his friend went down, Lysomedes felt for him, and standing right beside him, cast his bright spear and hit Apiseon, son of Hippasus, under the ribs in the liver. The man crumpled, the best warrior in deep-soiled Paeonia, after Asteropaeus, who watched him fall, pitied him, then charged the Greeks with everything he had. But there was nothing he could do. The Greeks had formed around Patroclus a wall of shields, forward from which they held their spears. Ajax was everywhere among them, seeing to it that not a man took one step backwards. From the body, or went out in front to show off, but that all stood together and fought close in. That was how big Ajax managed it, and the earth grew wet with dark blood as the dead fell thick and fast on both sides. Trojans, allies, Greeks too, who shed blood, but less of it, and with fewer casualties, because they fought in a tight group and protected each other. So the battle burned on, but you would have thought the sun had gone out, and the moon too, for they f fought in dark air. All the heroes clustered around Menoetius's slain son. The rest of the Trojans and Greeks had their war under the open sky and in brilliant sunlight, not a cloud on the horizon. They took breaks from fighting, avoiding each other's groaning shafts, making some open space in battle, but those in the center suffered the agony of combat in darkness with merciless bronze. All the best were there, except for two Greeks, Thrasymedes and Antilochus. They did not know blameless Patroclus was dead, and assumed he was still alive and fighting the Trojans in front. These two were struggling to keep their men alive and in combat, fighting off at some distance where Nestor ordered them when they left the ships. The day was passing. Men hacked slowly at each other in pain, the sweat from their labor coating their thighs and knees, pooling under their feet spattering from their arms into their glazed eyes as the two armies fought over Achilles' surrogate. A tanner gives his men an ox hide to stretch, having first drenched it in oil. They stand in a circle and pull at it until its moisture is squeezed out by all of their tugging and the oil has a chance to penetrate the taut leather's pores. So too the tight circle of men on either side, tugging at the corpse, the Trojans with high hopes of dragging it back to Ilion, the Greeks with their own hopes of getting it back to the ships. It was a savage fight, and not even Ares or Athena in their most belligerent moods could have watched it with disdain. Such was the labor for men and horses Zeus stretched over Patroclus that day. But all this time Achilles did not know Patroclus was dead, for they were fighting far from the ships, under Troy's walls, and Achilles never dreamed he would die there, but thought he would return alive after he reached the gates. Nor did he think Patroclus would take Troy without him, or with him for that matter. He had heard this many times from his mother when they had their talks, and she would tell him the intentions of Zeus. But his mother did not tell him now of this great evil, his dearest friend dead. 
Around the corpse they kept pressing hard, with sharp spears and killing each other. Some Greek would say from his bronze mask, Friends, there's no point in returning to the hollow ships. It would be better for the Black Earth to swallow us here, if we're going to let the Trojans haul him back to the city and win all the glory. Or some Trojan would say, Friends, even if we're all fated to die by this body, don't take a step back. These words would lift everyone's strength. While they fought on, and as the iron noise rose through the barren air to the bronze sky, Achilles' horses, some distance from the battle, were weeping, and had been since first they learned that their charioteer had fallen in the dust, under the hands of man-slaying Hector. Automedon, Diores's valiant son, was doing everything he could with lash, gentle words, and curses to get them moving, but the pair would not go back to the ships by the level sea, or back into battle, with the Achaeans. They stood still as stone, still as a post on a man's or woman's tomb. There in front of the beautiful chariot, their heads bowed to the earth, their tears rolling warm from their eyes to the ground. As they wept in longing for their charioteer, and their lustrous manes were fouled in the dust as they streamed to either side of the yoke. When he saw them mourning the son of Cronus, felt pity. He shook his head and said to himself, Ah, why did we give you to Lord Peleus, to a mortal, while you are deathless and ageless? Was it so you could share men's pain? Nothing is more miserable than men of all that breathes and moves upon earth. But Priam's son Hector will not drive you or your wrought chariot. That I will not allow. Is it not enough that he has the armor and struts vainly in it? No, in your knees and in your heart I will put strength, so you may bear Automedon out of the war to the hollow ships. For I will continue to give the Trojans glory to kill until they reach the ships. And the sun sets, and the darkness, the sacred darkness, comes on. And he breathed into the horses great strength. The two shook the dust from their manes, and raced with the chariot through the combatants. Automedon kept trying to fight, though grieving for his comrade, swooping with the horses like a vulture on a flock of geese, easily leaving the clamor of the Trojans behind, and just as easily bearing down on them. But he could not kill any of his quarry, since he was alone in the haunted chariot and could not handle a spear and drive too. Finally, a friend saw him and caught his eye. Alcimedon, son of Laerces Haemonides, who now stood behind the chariot and said, Automedon, which god has put this bad idea into your head and robbed you of your good sense, fighting the Trojans up here in the thick of things all alone? Your companion is dead, and Hector is strutting around in old Peleus's armor. Diores' son, Automedon, answered, Alcimedon, is there a man in the army who could control these immortal horses besides Patroclus? He had a will like a god's while he lived. Now death has caught up with him. But take the lash anyway, and the reins and I will dismount so I can fight. Alcimedon swung into the fast war chariot and took the reins and lash in his hands. Automedon jumped off. 
Hector saw the move and said to Aeneas, who was at his side, Aeneas, I've just spotted Achilles' horses coming into battle with a pair of weak drivers. I think I could take them if you would help. Their drivers couldn't stand up to men like us. Aeneas was willing, and the two went forward, shoulders hunched behind their shields, pounds of bronze welded to hardened leather. With them went Chromius and the godlike Aretas, who fully expected they would kill the men and drive off the high-necked horses. But Automedon would extract blood. For these childish hopes, he prayed to Lord Zeus and felt a dark surge of power within him, then spoke quickly to his trusted driver. Alcimedon, keep the horses close enough that I can feel their breath on my back. Hector won't stop until he mounts the chariot behind Achilles' horses, with us dead and the rest of the Argive army in rout, or until he himself goes down in the front. And he called to both Ajaxes and to Menelaus. Ajax! Both of you, and Menelaus too, leave the body for the best men you have to defend it against the Trojan onslaught and come help us out while we're still alive. Hector and Aeneas have weighed in here. The best Troy has. Well, it's in the gods' laps. I'll do what I can and leave the rest to Zeus. He balanced his long-shadowed spear and threw, hitting Aretas's shield, which did not stop the bronze point from penetrating all the way through and into his belly, just below his belt. When a strong man swings a sharp axe onto a bull's neck just behind the horns and cuts through all the sinews there, the animal pitches forward as it falls. Aretas pitched forward and fell on his back, undone by the razor-sharp spear that stuck, quivering in his entrails. Hector rifled his polished spear at Automedon, but Automedon saw it all the way and ducked, leaving it to punch into the ground and stand there, trembling, until Ares finally stilled its fury. They would have closed on each other with swords, but the two Ajaxes, responding to their comrade's call, stepped between them, sending cold chills through Hector, Aeneas, and Chromius, who all withdrew, letting Aretas lie there, mangled and dead. As Automedon stripped him, he said with grim satisfaction, This makes up for the death of Patroclus, though it is a lesser man I have killed. And he swung the bloody spoils into the chariot, and mounted, his feet and arms smeared with gore, like a lion that has just eaten a bull. The tense fight over Patroclus went on, made even more tense now by Athena, who stepped down from the sky, sent by Zeus. Zeus sometimes sends a shimmering arc from the sky as a portent of war, or of a cold rainstorm that brings men in from the fields and vexes the flocks. Athena wrapped herself in an iridescent mist, and entered the Greek throng, urging on each man, beginning with Atreus' son Menelaus, standing by his side and speaking to him in the guise of Phoenix and using his voice. The shame and dishonor will be mostly yours, Menelaus, if Lord Achilles' faithful comrade is savaged by dogs under Ilion's walls. Hold your ground and urge on the army! Menelaus, 
good at the war cry, answered, Phoenix, old sir, if only Athena would give me strength and shield me from spears, I would stand by Patroclus and protect him all day. I take his death hard, but Hector is on fire, just carving us up with his bronze. Zeus is giving him all the glory. Athena, eyes glinting in the sun, was glad that Menelaus had put her first in his prayers. She put power into his shoulders and knees, and into his breast the boldness of a horsefly, that however often it is flicked away from human flesh, persists in biting. For human blood is sweet. Menelaus felt that kind of boldness in his dark heart as he straddled Patroclus and threw his bright spear. There was among the Trojans a certain Podes, a son of Aetion, a rich, valiant man, whom Hector honored with a place at his table. Menelaus' spear hit him on the belt as he turned to run. The metal point went through and he fell with a thud. Atreus's red-haired son dragged the body to the main group of Greeks. Then Apollo stood close to Hector, seeming to be Aseus's son, Phanops, a dear family friend who lived in Abydos. In his likeness, the archer urged him on. Hector, is there any Greek who will fear you now? Look how you lost your nerve before Menelaus, a well-known weakling. He's taken the corpse out from under our noses, all by himself, and is gone. And he's killed your true friend and great hero, Podes, son of Aetion. A black cloud of grief enveloped Hector, and he strode forward in a blaze of bronze. At the same moment, the son of Cronus took his aegis, a fringed glare in the sky, and wrapped Ida in clouds. He thundered and lightened the and shook the Aegis, giving victory to the Trojans and routing the Greeks. Peneleos the Boeotian faulted first. A spear grazed his shoulder as he faced the enemy, but the blade sliced through to the bone. A lucky throw by Polydamus from close range. Leitus was next, nicked on the wrist by Hector, enough to make him quit the fight, seeing he couldn't grip a spear properly. This man was the son of Alectrion. As he withdrew, wide-eyed and apprehensive, Hector chased him, and Idomeneus took a shot at the Trojan, hitting him on the breastplate right by the nipple. But the spear's shaft shattered in its socket. The Trojans cheered. Hector returned the favor, his javelin just missing Idomeneus as he stood in his chariot. But hitting Coeranus, Meriones' charioteer and comrade from Lyctus. Idomeneus had set out from the ships on foot, and would have handed the Trojans a great coup had not Coeranus driven his fast horses by and given him some daylight. He saved the day, but lost his life to man-slaughtering Hector, whose spear got him behind the jaw, under the ear, plowing out his teeth and slicing his tongue lengthwise. He fell from the car and dropped the reins to the ground. Meriones bent over and scooped them up from the dirt and said to Idomeneus, Lay on the lash until you get back to the ships. You know as well as I do the Greeks are washed up. He spoke, and Idomeneus, in a panic now, lashed the maned horses back to the hollow ships. Not even Ajax and Menelaus failed to notice that Zeus had shifted the momentum to the Trojans, 
Big Ajax turned to his companion and said, Any fool can see that Father Zeus himself is helping the Trojans. Everything they throw hits home. It doesn't matter who throws it. Brave man or coward, Zeus guides them all straight. But we can't hit anything but the ground. Let's try to come up with the best plan we can to haul the corpse out and build morale by getting ourselves back to our comrades. They must feel despair when they look this way. I doubt if they think Hector can be stopped before he lays his hands on our black sailing ships. If only one of our men could get a message through, fast, to Achilles. I don't think he's heard the bad news that his best friend is dead. But I can't see any Greek who could do that job. They're all lost in dark mist. They're horses, too. Father Zeus, deliver the Greeks from the dark. Make the sky clear. Allow us to see with our eyes. Destroy us in the light, since destroy us you will. He spoke, and the father had pity for his tears. Instantly, he dispersed the darkness and mist, and the sun shone, and all the battle was clear. Then Ajax turned to Menelaus and said, Menelaus, see if you can spot Antilochus still alive, Nestor's son. Have him go quickly to Achilles and tell him his best friend is dead. Menelaus, who was good at the war shout, couldn't argue with this and started to leave. Very much like a lion that leaves a corral after it is tired of vexing the men and dogs, who, standing guard all night, will not allow it to seize the herd's prime bull. Lusting for flesh, the lion charges, but gets nothing for it but a rain of javelins launched by bold hands and flaming torches that stop it in its tracks. At dawn, the lion goes off in a sullen mood. Menelaus was just as reluctant to leave Patroclus's body, afraid of a general rout that would leave him stranded behind enemy lines. He lingered to remind his comrades of their duty. Both you Ajaxes, and Meriones too! Everyone should keep in mind what a good man our Patroclus was, gentle and kind to all, when he was alive, and now death has taken him. Finally, Menelaus left, glancing every which way. An eagle, whose eyesight is the keenest of all the birds in the sky, can spot from high altitude a rabbit crouching under a leafy bush, and, swooping down, catch it and instantly rip out its life. Yes, Menelaus, that's how your bright eyes swept everywhere through the allied troops, searching for Nestor's son. Was he still alive? And yes, spotted him on the battle's left, encouraging his men and urging them to fight. Menelaus made his way to his side and said, I have bad news, Antilochus. You know some god has turned the tide against us. Well, now the best of the Achaeans is dead. Patroclus. God, that it were not true. Run to the ships and tell Achilles. If he acts quickly, he might still save the body. Naked, though. Hector has the armor. He spoke, and Antilochus was choked with horror. He was speechless, astounded, his eyes welled with tears, his voice stuck in his throat. But he did not disregard Menelaus's orders. He started to run, giving his armor to his charioteer who drove beside him. He left the battlefield on foot and in tears, with a grim report for Achilles, son of Peleus. Menelaus had no intention of staying to help the sore-pressed troops from Pylos, who already missed their commander Antilochus. He dispatched Thrasymedes in his place and ran back to take his stand over Patroclus, 
next to the Ajaxes, to whom he said at once, I've sent Antilochus there ahead to the ships to go to Achilles, but we can't count on Achilles coming any time soon. He may want Hector badly, but he can't fight the Trojans unarmed and naked. We have to come up with the best plan we can to get the body out and escape ourselves from this deafening battle without any casualties. It was Big Ajax who came up with the plan. Right, Menelaus. You and Meriones get the body up on your shoulders and carry it out. We'll be behind you, holding off the Trojans and Hector. We have the same name and the same heart, and we've stuck with each other in battle before. They got their arms round the corpse and raised it high off the ground. The Trojans shouted out when they saw the Greeks lift their body and charged. Hunting dogs, after a wounded boar, will run up in front of the hunters, and for a while threaten to tear the boar apart. But when the boar pivots and trusts its strength, the dogs quail and slink back one by one. So too the Trojans, who would launch mass attacks, thrusting with swords and double-edged spears, but when the two Ajaxes wheeled and made a stand, they would all turn pale, not a single man willing to make a quick move and contend for the corpse. In this way, this little knot of Greeks did their best to carry Patroclus' body out of combat and back to their ribbed ships while against them the battle strained and coiled, as wild as fire when it engulfs a city, suddenly, and sets it aflame, and the houses shrivel in the heat, and the wind roars like thunder. So too, as they went on, the eternal din of horses, cars, and spearmen noise like heat. Or think of a team of mules, matched in strength, dragging a load down a craggy mountain path, a beam, say, or a huge ship timber. Their spirits flag with the toil and sweat, but they push on. So these two Greeks pushed on with the corpse, and the two Ajaxes held the enemy off. A wooded ridge that lies across a plain will check the cruel currents of swollen rivers, turning them back to spread over the plain, and the floods, though strong, never break through. So the two Ajaxes contained the Trojans' offensive push, but the Trojans kept coming, and two among them especially, Aeneas, Anchises' son, and glorious Hector. A cloud of starlings or jackdaws will loop around, shrieking doom when they see ahead of them a falcon, which brings death to smaller birds. So too before Aeneas and Hector, the Greeks ran shrieking, as if it were the end of the world. The trench was littered with their beautiful, discarded weapons. But there was no armistice.